Uh, well, hey, before, before you're seated, I want to read a scripture with you today. Um, if you're our guest, my name is Roby. I'm one of the pastors here and glad that you're here. And um, I, I want to read the scripture. I just want you to hear straight from the word of God. This is the book of Jude, verse 20. Here's what it says. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit. Look at these two words. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Keep yourselves. What are those two words? Keep yourselves. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Okay, you can go ahead and have a seat. Uh, this text that we're going to look at today is so powerful. It's so practical that I want to jump right in and for us to, to get right into this text and see what it has to say for our lives today. I want to do that and I want to set things up with this story that I recently heard. heard. Many of you know my wife, Rebecca, grew up uh, outside of Washington, D.C., in the Maryland area. And so whenever we go up to visit family, at least one time, uh, Rebecca and I will take it. Sometimes we take the kids. We'll go into Washington, D.C., and there's this one route we almost always go. It's always thrilling to drive over the Potomac and into the city. And we drive right by this very old bridge called the Chain Bridge. It's been around for uh, over 100 years, and I recently heard a story about that bridge, and I will never drive by that bridge again after hearing this particular story. I'll always think of this, and it's kind of a Memorial Day story because it goes all the way back to the Civil War, okay? And I, I want to just set this story up, so I want you to slip into the scene with me. It's a September morning. And all other reasons, it's like any other morning. There's a man named William Scott, and he's walking out into a field. And so you can hear just the sound of the grass crunching under his feet and the dew on the grass as he's walking out. Birds are chirping in that area. You've got orioles and cardinals and robins. They're in the pine trees all around chirping because it's a brand new, fresh morning. Maybe even the, the smell of fall, maybe already kind of creeping into the air. It's a crispness, right, around that time of year, right? Just kind of whispering and hinting that fall is coming. So much promise in this brand new morning. But that's not what William Scott feels. He feels total and utter dread because he's walking to his execution. It's probably dead silent in that field aside from the, aside from the sound of the, the drum as he's being marched out blindfolded. And he's going to stand in front of a firing squad of Union soldiers. But what makes this particularly interesting is that he himself is a Union soldier. He's actually going to be executed by men in his own battalion, his own brigade. They're, they're men that had eaten next to him, fought beside to him. They are now going to execute this man, William Scott. Now you say, what did he do? Like, what, what happened that caused him to be executed? I mean, was he, you know, was it a, a treason? Did he trade secrets to the Confederacy? What was it? No, it all happened on the chain bridge. We actually have a picture, a historic picture of the chain bridge. Check this out. I love this picture because it's actually a picture that, that happened at, during the Civil War. You can see Union soldiers there lining the bridge. We've got another one that kind of zooms in a little bit. Look at this. You see the Union soldiers there. This is the chain bridge leading over the Potomac. And that little hut there is where the sentry was supposed to be posted to keep watch to make sure the enemy soldiers didn't cross this bridge. Well, the person that I told you about, William Scott, here's what he looks like. Here's a picture of of William Scott, he fought for the Union, and he was supposed to stand guard, probably in that very shack on the chain bridge, he was supposed to stand guard late in the night and make sure no enemy soldiers tried to come over the Potomac, and because if they did, think of the gravity of what might happen. If they crossed over, they could wipe out the, the soldier. They, they, could, they could attack Washington, D.C. They could uh, knock out the army. They could, it may turn the war. And so he was supposed to stand guard. Well, that night, he was caught sleeping on the job. And so he was court-martialed. And the crime for falling asleep when you're supposed to keep watch, the crime for falling asleep is the death penalty. Because if an army comes while you're falling asleep, I mean, you're going to be the first one gone. 
then your unit, maybe the whole army, and maybe the nation that is hoping your army saves them. So that morning he gets marched out. The uh, major general named McClellan reads out his sentence. Now imagine he got walked out. I mean, everyone is, this is a man they know. I mean, just a, a hushed silence. Maybe the drums kind of roll and then come to a stop. Maybe he's staring there kind of shaking behind his blindfold. And then Major McClellan reads this. Private William Scott of Company K of the 3rd Regiment of Vermont Volunteers, having been found guilty by court-martial of sleeping on his post while a sentinel on picket guard has been sentenced to be shot and the sentence has been approved and ordered to be executed. The men there holding their rifles are waiting for the command to raise their rifle. Then he continues. The commanding officers of the brigade... The regiment of the company, uh, of, uh, of the command, together with many other officers and privates of his regiment, have earnestly appealed to the major general commanding to spare the life of the offender. And the president of the United States has expressed a wish that as this is the first condemnation to death in this army for this crime, mercy may be extended to the criminal. So here's what's happened. While he's been under arrest, some of the other privates have petitioned the major general. Some of the other officers have said, please pardon him. I know that that's the law. I know that the law is he fell asleep on his job and he should be executed. But please, can, can you pardon him? Abraham Lincoln himself caught wind. And he wrote a letter to Major General McClellan and sent it asking, saying, hey, I didn't command it. He said, I, I hope that this man would be pardoned. Because it's the first crime like this that's happened. I know what the law says, but this is the first time it's happened. The story goes that after he sent the letter, he couldn't stand by and wait. He actually got in his carriage and drove all the way to meet with Major General McClellan himself, asking for the pardon. So here it is, the morning of. Everyone's wondering what's going to happen. The general continues. This fact, viewed in connection with the inexperienced of the condemned as a soldier, his previous good conduct, and the general good character, and the urgent entreaties made in his behalf, have determined the major general commanding to grant the pardon so earnestly prayed for. Can you imagine just the exhale from the, everyone in the entire, the entire field? I mean, Private William Scott must have almost collapsed. He had pardoned him from being executed. But I want you to hear what he said at the end of this, that he read in front of all of the soldiers standing there that day. I want you to hear how he ended it. He says this. This act of clemency must not be understood as affording a precedent for any future case. The duty of a sentinel is of such a nature that its neglect by sleeping upon or deserting his post may endanger the safety of a command or even the whole army and all nations affixed to the offense the penalty of death. Private William Scott of Company K of the 3rd Regiment of Vermont Volunteers will be released from confinement and returned to duty by command of Major General McClellan. What I want you to hear at the end of his pardon, I mean, he waited the last minute. I mean, Private William Scott marched all the way out there with a blindfold, wondering if he would feel the final moments of bullets penetrating him. And then he, his friends wondered if they'd see him collapse. He was pardoned in the final moment. But I want you to see what Major General McClellan said. He was very clear. He said, this pardon has happened for a series of reasons. One of them is not that being executed is not a just punishment for this particular crime. That's still the just punishment, he says. And he said, I don't want anyone to see this as a precedent because the next person who falls asleep on watch will surely not be pardoned. The just punishment according to that general and according to the laws at the time, the just punishment for falling asleep on watch were punishable by death. It was a big deal. You could be killed and the whole army you're supposed to be watching for could be killed as well, all your brothers in arms, your brothers and sisters in arms. Now, I want to bring that story over to what we're talking about today. Because I believe in, in our lives, the Bible talks about there are relationships that we're called to keep watch over. 
we stand guard for certain relationships in our lives. And I think some of them are very intuitive, and I think some of them we take very seriously, but I think some of them, we actually kind of fall asleep on the job. I think there's some that we take very seriously, like our, maybe our kids. We can't help, you know, most people, they, we can't help feeling like we're keeping watch and guarding over our children. We, we know that instinctively. Hopefully we feel that about our spouse. We keep watch over their lives. We stand guard over their lives. We feel that about extended family. We, we, we kind of take ownership for our family and we keep watch over them. Hopefully that's, that's the case, or at least we know that that should be instinctual. But I think sometimes we forget that the other relationships in our lives, namely our friendships, are actually relationships we're supposed to keep watch over their lives. And sometimes we forget to do that and we fall asleep at our post. But here's what I think is true deep down inside. We all feel this. The very relationships that we're all dying for, the very friendships that we're dying for are those type of friendships that keep watch over each other's lives. We don't just do things together. We don't just hang out. We stand guard over each other's lives. I think that's what we're dying for. Let me put it more succinctly. If there's one thing I want you to walk out of here with today, if there's one major point, it would be this. God's intention is that friends stand guard over each other's lives. It's not just a nice thing we want. It's God's intention. God's intention is that friends stand guard over each other's lives. Now, you might say, look, I, that's great. I'd, I'd love to have a friend like that, but I don't know how to find that friend. Even if I did have, you know, some possibilities of those friendships in my life, I don't know how to do that. How do I cultivate that? How do I get an existing acquaintance or friend to the place where we are standing guard over each other's life? I want that. I don't know how to do that. I'm going to give you three thoughts. Actually, this text is going to give us three thoughts on how to do that today. And I'm just gonna give you the, f the first one right here. If you're taking notes, it's gonna be up on the screen so you can write it down. Here's the first one. If we are going to stand guard, we must spiritually build each other up. If we're gonna stand guard, if we want those kind of friendships that we're keeping watch over each other's lives, if we're going to stand guard over each other, we've gotta spiritually build each other up. Let me go back to this text. I wanna read this scripture to you. It's in Jude ch uh, chapter one, verses 20 and 21. Here's what it says. Let me just read this text to you. But you, beloved, don't you love that he gives, he gives you the nickname beloved? Don't you love that? Did you know all throughout the New Testament, one of the most common nicknames for you, you who are followers of Christ, the people of God, one of the most common nicknames he gives you is beloved. Man, that's so beautiful. But you, beloved, building yourselves up. Do you see that? Building yourselves up in your most holy faith. Look at this other one. And praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Now here's how these verses are working. There's one central command in these verses. It's what we quoted together. The central command in here is keep yourselves. Keep yourselves in the love of God. That word keep in the original language is not just hold on to. The word keep is stand guard. It's keep watch over. It's what someone would do if he's guarding a prisoner or if he's protecting someone else. You keep watch. There is a command. It's not a suggestion. You have been commanded. You have been given an assignment to keep each other in the love of God. This book of Jude is written to a group of Christians. It's to be read in, a, in the context of a church. We are a group of Christians, a church, and so this is a command from God to us. You are commanded to keep watch, to keep guard over each other. It says, keep each other in the love of God. Now, let's just take a second on this. We could spend our whole time on this. This is so significant. Now, he had just given us and reminded us of our nickname, Beloved. That's who you are. You're ones who are loved by God. This is a nickname that Jude is using here. James uses Paul uses, Peter uses, John uses. All these people who are close to Jesus, closest to Jesus, they refer to you as ones loved by God. That's not a status. 
That's not an achievement. That is your identity. Christian, let me just ask you this. Okay, I'm at, I, I want a response here too. Did you earn that nickname, Beloved? Did you earn it? No, you didn't. It was given to you by the work of Jesus Christ. You don't do enough good where all of a sudden God's like, man, I just love that person. No, it's not by your good works. It's by this one incredible good work of Jesus Christ who had no sin, died on the cross, paid for your sin and my sin, rose again and rose again from the dead. That one great work washes away our sins. And so even though we're not perfect and we're working out that salvation and he's working inside of us, he declares that we're beloved. That's not something that you worked to gain. So it's not something by works you can lose. That's encouraging, right? That's who you are. You are beloved. So then why are we commanded, the central command of these verses, keep yourselves in the love of God. I can't lose it. What are we doing? We're commanded to stand guard over each other to make sure we stay and remain in the identity we already have. That's where we get into trouble. We forget who we already are. Oh, I'm so far from God, or God's so mad at me, or oh, I've messed up again. No, that's not who you are. You're beloved. His mercy's new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. His grace and mercy washes over you like a constant waterfall. He's He's washing you clean. You are beloved. We keep each other in the identity of who we already are. That's what he's saying here. It's so powerful. He says you do that in a couple ways. And what he said in here is you build each other up in your most holy faith. Here's what we're supposed to do in each other's lives. Here's what God's intention for friendship. If we're going to keep stand guard and keep watch over each other, we've got to build each other up spiritually. That same phrase, it's like a construction phrase is all through the New Testament talking about how our relationships are supposed to, are supposed to, we're supposed to have them. You know, so often in our, our friendships, when we think about our friendships, we think of that as part of that kind of unspiritual, regular side of our life. We have like the spiritual side. It's where we pray and read the Bible and sing and go to church. You know, we overcome sin. You know, it's like our spiritual side. And then we've got like the regular side, like doing the dishes, Okay, and like going and playing golf or, you know, hanging out with your friends. And then you got your friends. You know, you do hobbies together. We call that like the, we think of that as like the unspiritual side. But you know what the Bible says? There is no such thing as an unspiritual side. It all flows out. Every, you can make everything into an act of worship, including doing the dishes. There's a teenager that needed to hear that today, okay? <laughs> including doing the dishes, all right? It, can, it all flows out of our spiritual side. So listen, your friendships, what this is saying, God not only cares about them, he's designed them. They're important. He's designed them. There's a foundational spirituality to your friendships. That doesn't mean that's, the, the, it means everything flows out of that. That doesn't mean that's all you ever do or talk about, but it flows out of that. But I don't think that's our issue. I think our issue is we forget to apply the spiritual side to our friendships. We forget that in our friendships, we weave in spirituality in there so that we're stirring each other up, making each other more like Jesus. Well, let me just specifically just take a second and, and speak to, to the men for a second because, ladies, I think you are so much more relationally intuitive and instinctual, and sometimes we as, as men, we don't know how to do this. Like, we don't know how to have conversations to each other beyond, like, what, you know, what, how are the heat doing? You know, what would happen to the heat? You know, and your car, your carburetor's broken. Oh, let me take a look at that there. You know, we don't, we don't know how to have these conversations, you know, like beyond like this, this surface level. And you might be like, look, dude, I, I don't know how to have a, how do I have a spiritual conversation with a guy friend? I mean, what is that going to look like? You know, we're pr- playing basketball. He drains a three pointer. We're running back on defense. Hey, great job. How are things spiritually? Just real quick, before the defense comes out. I just want to know, how are things? Like, what does that even look like? How do we even have that spiritual conversation? But men, let me just ask you something. When has there been something you don't know how to do and that's ever stopped you from figuring it out? Figure it out. Here's a couple tips. Maybe you just start by initiating the vulnerability. 
you get some time with uh, one of your guy friends that you trust, that knows the Lord, you know is pursuing the Lord, and maybe you initiate it. Hey, can I just share something that's going on with me that I'm wrestling with and I'm struggling with? Maybe you initiate the vulnerability. And then if you're receiving that vulnerability, don't fix it. Just listen. Well, what do I do? Just listen. Yeah, but how? Just listen in your ear. I don't know. You know, just listen. Don't get sagely. Don't all of a sudden give all this counsel back. Just be in the moment with your guy friend and say, man, I'm sorry you're going through that. Um, and if you went through something similar, maybe share in that moment, hey, I'm walking through that now or I went through that too. I, I will pray for you. And then remember to pray for them. And by the way, men, not a bad couple tools to take over into your marriage as well. Just a thought. Can I get an amen from any of the ladies in here? Can I get an amen? Hallelujah over here. That one. Um, we're suppo- our friendships, we're supposed to take these friendships. There's supposed to be a spiritual dimension to your friendships. The spiritual side flows into those. That's what our calling is, to build each other up in our friendships. But there's something else that said. It said keeping each other in the love of God. We do that by building each other up in our most holy faith. Here's the second one. These seem so simple, but they're profound. I don't want us to miss the profound nature of these ones. Here's the second one. If you're taking notes, it's going to come up here on the screen. Here's, here's what it says, tells us to do. If we're going to stand guard, we must pray over each other. What this said is it, that seems like, a, maybe that seems obvious, or maybe that seems like uninteresting, or maybe that's like, yeah, 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 I know that. But that was a big enough deal to make it in this last list of how we stand guard and keep each other. And I think what we do is we forget how important and significant that is. What it reminds us is to pray in the Spirit. Now, the New Testament says a lot about praying in the Spirit. There's a lot we could talk about about that, about how to pray in the Spirit. But let's just hit it at just a broad level for, for our purposes here today. Because we've been washed clean by the work of Jesus, we've been declared beloved, Here's what then that means. We're actually, if you are a follower of Christ, you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. If you're here and you're like, look, I'm not sure I'm a follower of Christ. I don't know that I would call myself a Jesus follower or a Christian. Lean in and here's what the Bible says. When you start following Jesus, the forgiveness that happens is so thorough that the Holy Spirit comes and dwells inside of you. That's the same Spirit through which the universe was made, the worker of miracles, that spirit is living inside of you. Have you ever heard the phrase, uh, my body is a temple? That was stolen from a part of the Bible that was talking about this dimension. And we talk about this mainly in our culture regarding health stuff, don't we? You're like, hey, hey bro, you want a slice of pizza? He's like, no, I'm sorry, my body's a temple. I only eat kale and quinoa, okay? And unless that pizza has a cauliflower crust, okay, I'm not going to eat it, okay? Now, look, if you're into that, God bless you. You're probably, you'll probably outlive us, okay? But we've all been eating pizza together, and you haven't joined us. You might be alone at the end, okay, because I just, I just want to prepare you, okay? But um, th- that's true. There, there is a truth to that. There is. We should take care of our, our bodies. We should be good stewards. But that's one tiny piece of this amazing concept, Christian you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. So when you pray, think about that. The one, yeah, can we celebrate that? When you pray, think about that. You're, the one you're praying to for a miracle is inside of you directing your prayers. So when, you're, when, you, when you, your friend comes to you and say, look, I'm going through a hard time, can you pray for me? What happens next? Sure, you got it, man. I will pray. Sometimes, maybe it's like a quick, hey, bless George. Amen. Sometimes we just forget. But do you realize the power of how we stand guard by pouring over each other in prayer? In fact, the Bible says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with you also. When, when the Holy Spirit is bringing us together in unity to pray for each other, there's something powerful that happens. So small groups, I, I, I wish that every single person that called City Rev their church home would find a small group. If you're watching online, we have ones that meet by Zoom. We have meet all over the city, all stages of life. We'd love for you to get involved in a, in a small group. 
One of the reasons is because at the end of talking through the teaching and at the end of, of sharing together, at the end of that, they stop and they pray together. Sometimes they all pray together. Sometimes guys circle up and pray and the ladies circle up and pray and they take prayer requests, small groups, a couple things. Don't underestimate the power of praying over each other. The Holy Spirit is in the room. The, the miracle worker that lives inside of you is there as you're praying for each other. This is an incredible moment. So when you give a prayer request, give the real one. If all that you're praying for is Aunt Edna's toenail in Nebraska, okay, I mean, that's fine. But what's the real prayer request? Because there are marriages that need to get healed. There are people doubting their faith. There's people on the edge of falling into sin. There are people that are struggling financially or struggling in their health. There's, there's physical healings that need to take place. The, the Holy Spirit is in the room. Give the real prayer request. Small groups, create a space that's safe and confidential and non-judgmental so that people can give the real prayer request. And then when you leave, labor for each other in prayer. Write it down. Wake up every morning and pray for each other. Text each other, hey, I know you got that surgery this morning. I know you got that big meeting. I know you, you're gonna see your, your son or your daughter for the first time in 15 years. I'm praying for you today. Pray for each other. And I want you just to envision what could it be like, City Rev, if every City Rev person is part of a small group and as we leave to go out into the city, we're covered in a, in a woven tapestry of prayer over each other's life and every significant meeting here in this workplace and significant meeting there is being empowered by the Holy Spirit because it's being lifted up by an army of prayer. Why do you want to get in a City, in a, in a, in a city Rev small group? Because you need that kind of prayer in your life, if for no other reason. We stand guard over each other. When we pray for each other, that's a big deal. It's not a small thing. Let's labor for each other, for our friends in prayer. Here's the last one it says. If we're going to stand guard, we must point each other to eternity. Did you notice how it ended here? It said that... Um, we're waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. That mercy has been won. It's been purchased by Jesus on the cross. And so we're just waiting to see that realized. There's a day that we will all stand before Jesus Christ. We'll all stand before him and give an account for our lives. And we'll be wondering if we'll receive mercy or not. We receive mercy based on what Jesus did. That's sealed. So all we're waiting for is to see the day when it actually comes to fruition. And so we're, how do we keep watch over each other? We're, we're together waiting for eternity. As beloved, do you know how your, your, your identity has shifted? You're no longer an earthling. You're, no, you're a stranger and an alien here. You're, you're a citizen of heaven. You are destined as adopted into the family of God to be an heir and to reign with him for eternity. You have eternity waiting for you. This is, this is barely the beginning. It's not even the waiting room. This is a shadowy, shadowy hint of the true life that is to come in Jesus Christ. And so what we do as a, in our friendships is we do one of two things. We either anchor each other to earth or we point each other to eternity. Because here's the thing, we influence each other. Our friends are some of the greatest influencers in our lives. Parents of teenagers, you know that because you saw that subtle shift as you are this exclusive influencer in their life and all of a sudden their, their friends have such a large influence on their life and it never changes. Our friends are some of the greatest influencers in, in our lives. We see where our friends vacation. And we're like, hey, I never thought about going there. Should we go there? We see the cars that our friends drive. We're like, wow, that's a nice car. Did you, did you hear they, they drive one of those? I never thought we should check that out. We move where our friends move. We wear the clothes that our friends wear. We pick up the hobbies that our friends pick up. We often eat the foods and try the restaurants. We influence each other. So here's the question. Are the friendships in my life or, or the people who call me friend, am I anchoring them to living like earth is all there is? Or by our friendship, are we together pointing to eternity and living like this is not even the beginning? I will live for eternity. 
And I want to bring as many people with me. And I want to, I want to sow seeds that, that will bear fruit into eternity. I want to do things that will matter a billion years from now. Do I have friendships that spur me on and point to eternity? That's the kind of friendships that we want. Because uh, of all those things that we influence each other on, you know what else that we've seen as a church? We've seen the power of one family step up and become a foster family. And then their friends help them. And then this friend says, yeah, we can do that. And then these friends see that them two do it. And they're like, they're doing it too. And they're in the same season of like, we could do that. And then these people who are not even in the same season of like, I can't believe they're doing it. Let's do it too. See, I've seen, we've seen what happens when friendships are influencing each other to point to heaven. Or how about a, a friend that goes off on, on a, the first in a friend group that goes off on a mission trip. And the other friend's like, you're going where? You're going to use your vacation to go where? That does not sound re refreshing or relaxing. I don't know, we're just, we want to try it. And then they come back. And they can't stop talking about it. It was one of the hardest and but most rewarding experiences of their lives. And they tell their friends, man, we're, we're going to use a week of every single vacation for every year to do. We can't wait to go back. And now their friends say, oh, well, maybe we'll go. Their friends, okay, well, we're not going to miss the next one. We can't miss out on that. See, friends, we can influence each other to eternity or we can anchor each other to earth. We want to be the type of friends that point to each other for, for all of eternity. He's designed. God intends for our friendships to not just be a buddy over a hobby. You know that. Because what you're dying for is that friendship uh, that's watching over your life. Man, I'm, I'm with you. I'm keeping guard. I've got your back. I'm keeping guard over your life. That's what he commands us to do. It's like I love what Pastor Justin said last week. He said friendships are not optional, they're essential. But he said sometimes when, when we think we're saying essential, we say, okay, it's not optional, and we upgrade it to optimal, as if it's still an ideal. No, it's a command. So the question is, we've been commanded to keep guard over each other's lives. Have we fallen asleep on the job? Because that's dangerous for me. If I'm the sentinel, and the army comes in and I'm sleeping, I'm the first one gone. And then it takes out all the people I'm supposed to keep watch over. Have I fallen asleep on the job? I'm supposed to keep watch over my, my friends' lives and they're supposed to keep watch over my life. So maybe we awaken to the command that we're called to. Can I challenge you to take a step forward today? If you're in a small group, take it seriously. Go, share, pray. Be consistent. Serve each other. Make meals. Walk alongside each other. Invest in each other's families. If you've not been to small group in a long time, but you're on a roster somewhere, in a couple weeks, the small group term is starting up. It's time to go back. If there's anything we've learned here lately, it's the dangers of being isolated. If you're not in a small group, it's time. Remember, City Rev, we're not just a place where you attend. That's not who you are. You're part of a family. You're part of a body. You're a, a brick in a building that God is building. This is what the Bible says about who you are. It's time. Take a step to be in intentional relationships. Here's what I want you to do. I want everyone to take out your cell phone. If you're watching online, I want you to take out your cell phone. Can everyone take out your cell phone, please? Take a second. If you have the City Rev app, I want you to open up the City Rev app. If you don't, you can take a moment, go to your app store, and get the CityRev app. If you don't want to do that, you can also just go to cityrev.org slash groups. Now, some of you opened your phone just now, and you saw that you've missed 17 text messages since we started. Resist the temptation to get distracted, okay? They'll still be waiting for you in about 10 minutes, okay? Just resist the temptation, okay? Go to the CityRev app. The second thing on the homepage is get in a group. Even if you're in a group, I want you to go to get in a group. Or you can go to cityrev.org slash groups. I want you just to scroll down through that list. You'll see groups from every stage of life all over our region. They meet all different times during the week. 
many in person, some over Zoom. I want you to take a look at the group, those groups. What I want you to do before you leave today, before you leave this service, I want you to click on a couple that align with maybe your stage of life or your availability or both, and I want you to send the group leader an email. It's a button. Now, here's what happens. When you click send them an email, it will send that group leader all of your personal information, including your credit history and your social security number, okay? No, it doesn't do that. It doesn't even say, hey, I'm signing up for your group. It doesn't even say that. All it says, there's a pre-written email that says, could I have more information about your group? That's all it does. So you can hit send an, e you can hit send an email to the group leader and then just click send and it will send an email and you will then get contacted by that group leader this week and they will give you more information about that group. What I want to challenge you to do is to not be a hearer of the word only, be a doer. God intends for you to have friendships that keep watch over your life and intend for you to keep watch over your friends' lives. That is essential to our faith. Some, one of the things we often say here is the journey of following Jesus is not a solo sport. It's a team sport. That's how you're designed to grow. Take a step today before you leave here. Now, I told you that that story that I shared with you about William Scott was a Memorial Day story. Um, and, and that has a lot to do with what happened after he was pardoned. I learned that there is a road in Vermont, which is where he's from. There's a section of, the, of a highway that is named the William Scott Memorial Highway. In fact, I think we have a picture of that. Um, check out this picture, a beautiful stretch of road there right through Vermont. And, um, and I was thinking to myself, why would they... I mean, this is a guy that made a mistake. Why do you, you know, memorialize a highway after someone who made a mistake? There's like a stone plaque and everything, the William Scott Memorial Highway, and it's not because of the mistake he made. It's what happened two months later. Two months later, he was fighting in a battle, and the Union forces got terribly overmatched. Tons of casualties in that battle. And William Scott was one of those casualties. But here's what he did. As they were fleeing in retreat, he was helping many of his fellow soldiers out of a river. They say he helped five or six get to safety. And while helping his fellow soldiers, he got shot five or six times. And they took him to the medical tent to see if they could cure him and save him from his, his wounds. And when it became apparent to all, including um, Private William Scott, that he was going to die. He looked at one of the men standing around and he, he made them promise that they would report back to President Abraham Lincoln how he died because he wanted to thank Abraham Lincoln for giving him the privilege of dying in battle to save his fellow soldiers. But imagine you, you were one minute standing there with blindfolded, shaking, wondering if you'd get shot. The next minute, the president himself has pardoned you. Man, you're going to live different after that, aren't you? You're not going to live the same. You've got a second lease on life. And you might say, wow, you only, you only live like two more months after that. No, no, he, he died for his country. He died for his fellow soldiers. The same man who, through a mistake, endangered his fellow soldiers, now gave his life to save him. And the difference was a pardon. You know, you've been pardoned. But I want to tell you about your pardon because it's a little bit different. Can I repaint the, the story? Let me just tell you that same story, but it's a little bit different. I'm going to tell you like another way. This isn't what happened, but let me just, let's just imagine. I want you to imagine that General, Major General McClellan decided not to pardon Private William Scott. And Abraham Lincoln heard of it. And so that morning, he takes his carriage to where they're all lined up, and he reads he's been condemned guilty, and they raise up their rifles, and they're pointing it right at Private Scott, and out walks tall Abraham Lincoln with his hat, and he walks right in front of the rifles and walks all the way to the condemned prisoner with the blindfold tied around his head, and he reaches behind it, and facing with the rifles at his back, takes the blindfold off, and all of a sudden, Private Scott sees the president standing right he says, son, you can stand aside. And he turns around. And I want you to imagine he tied the blindfold on himself. 
And the rifle, the men, they, they put the rifles down. He says, no, raise the rifles. You can fire when ready. And the, ma the major general says, no, 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 no pre Mr. President, Mr. President, you're, you're not the one that, that committed the crime. I know. But let someone else give their life, not the president. We need the, the president. No, I want to do it. Because I know that you need to uphold justice. But I also want to show mercy. And he stood there with the blindfold and commanded them to fire. And they all watched on. And finally there was the crack of the rifles. And they watched the president drop. Can you imagine if that's what had happened? What would you do if you were William Scott then? You weren't just pardoned. president traded life, his life for you. Man, there's, there's not actual leaders like that, are there? No. There's just one. The greatest leader in history. Your Savior. That's what your pardon was like. The Son of God paid your penalty so you could walk free. How then are you going to are you going to live to give your life for your fellow soldiers? I hope that you would. Let's be that kind of people that do that for each other. Because that's our assignment from command to keep guard over each other. You might be here and say, look, I talked about mercy. That moment I stand before God, I hope One day when I die, he'll let me into heaven. I hope I have his mercy. You know, you can know for sure today. You can walk out of here knowing that mercy and eternity and heaven is a guarantee. You just have to accept the pardon that happened on your behalf. Jesus died in your place. And go and live in light of that truth. Yeah, your identity as beloved. Accept that he died to pay for your sin and rose again so that you too live for eternity. If you want to accept that, I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer. Right here in your seat, whether you're watching at home or sitting here, just I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Would you bow your head and close your eyes with me? If you want to take that step, let's just pray together. I'm going to say some words and you make these your prayer to God. Say, Jesus, silently in your heart, just say, Jesus, I want to be saved. I believe you took the penalty for me. You took my pardon. I'm going to live in light of that incredible act of love. Thank you for saving me. I believe you died to pay for my sins. I believe you rose again. And I too will rise and live forever in heaven. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, if just then that was your prayer, here's what I want you to do. If you're watching online, go to cityrev.org slash faith. There's a link right there you can click on. Go to cityrev.org slash faith. If you're here at the end of the service, you can also go to cityrev.org slash faith, or you can go into the parking lot. There's a tent that's our guest services. Go there, and we want to give you a Bible. We want to celebrate with you because you're part of a family. And so I want you to go to that tent say, hey, I put my faith in Jesus. Could I have a tent? We're going to celebrate that. If you're watching online, you've gone to cityrev.org slash faith. Fill out that information because we're going to mail you a Bible. Because, again, we do this together. It's designed for us to grow together as friends. We're going to do this together. Church, we're going to close our time by celebrating that our God is so faithful. He's always with us. He actually, Jesus is the friend that sticks closer than a brother. And we're going to celebrate that goodness together. Would you stand with me as we sing?